class was not in session today for 340,000 Chicago public school students after the city's teachers union voted not to show up for in-person work amid the latest COVID surge. After classes took place both Monday and Tuesday, the union voted late last night to teach virtually instead, prompting officials to cancel today's classes altogether. The union cited unsafe conditions for teaching, including staff shortages and a lack of testing for students, as cases reached a record high in the state today. Teachers may not return to the buildings until January 18th if they can't reach a consensus over safety measures, according to the union president. The mayor criticized the union's move and suggested the group was mounting an illegal work stoppage in the nation's third largest school district. We don't know how long the CTU leadership will try to stretch this work stoppage. What we were originally told it was is going to be a single day of action. Now we heard later today that it's going to be through January 18th. But the fact of the matter is that we have an obligation to advocate on behalf of parents and children and be their voice at the table. And that's precisely what we have done and that's precisely what we will continue to do. Joining me now to discuss Randy Weingarten, president of the American Federation of Teachers. So, Randy, the Chicago Teachers Union, as I understand it, is part of the American Federation of Teachers, but this vote is a departure from the AFT. You yourself have been advocating for schools to remain open for, for, uh, for the month. What do you make of this move? So, first off, Charles, thanks for having me. It's, Chicago is an anomalous situation. Um, think about the big three. L.A. is working it through, having testing for every um, child, figuring that out, starting school next week. New York, after a bumpy couple of days, and I was in a New York City school today with uh, UFT President Michael Mulgrew, PS157, um, rigorous testing, um, masks for everybody, uh, things are going much better. 95% of public schools in America are open now, despite the huge surge, because we are dealing with having mitigation circum having mitigations that will help, you know, deal with this surge. And if, just like with the airlines, if there are problems and shortages, then either some schools are closing in those districts or those districts are taking a pause. So when I say Chicago is anomalous, sorry, when I say Chicago is anomalous, it's the only place where you had a mayor who refused to work last week to get the testing that we needed that these other big districts are doing. So, you know, I understand that. So if you don't have the testings, teachers don't feel safe. But this is such a, you know, a, a puzzle for, uh, for everyone involved. The teachers need to be safe in order to do their work. Uh, but, you know, as you and others have pointed out over and over again, there are a lot of students who are going to fall behind if they're out of class. They're going to miss meals that they would not have otherwise gotten. They're going to just miss the socialization of being in a school, which is sometimes right. safer than the environment they have at home. There's so many variables that you kind of have to weigh against each other about what makes everyone involved the safest that they can possibly right. be. Do you worry at all that, that, that what is happening in Chicago, you know, yes, they should have enough testing, but those children possibly being out for the next two weeks creates its own set of dangers, does it not? Yes, I do, I do worry about it. And I do worry about it. And frankly, you know, it is really important. Well, so let me say this. If the teachers in America didn't think it was really, really important for schools to be open in the middle of this COVID surge, as all these other places are, are closing for in-person work, we wouldn't have 95% of the schools open. Teachers are 
you know, they're, they're vaccinated, many of them are boosted. The issue about testing is so that you can see who is sick and who isn't sick in a highly transmitted um, virus. And so that's the best practice, and that's why we're redonning our masks and having that testing. So I'm gonna actually ask you, Charles, if it's this important to get schools open and it's this important that to have kids in school, why wasn't why didn't Lori Lightfoot move heaven and earth to get testing into Chicago like LA did and like New York did and like Washington DC has done? How much can we ask parents and teachers to do? They are doing a Herculean job and they want to be in school, including in Chicago. So that's why through the, you know, the holiday, my locals all across America were working, rolling up their sleeves to get the circumstances and the mitigations because we know this is really important and we want to be in school. You know, the, the, the guidance about who can get boosted has now shifted so that now more <laughs> school age children can get the booster shot. But that's happening at the same time. We're seeing a real surge in the number of children who are being uh, being uh, sick enough to be admitted into hospitals. Right. Most of those are unvaccinated cases, of course. But, you know, does this change the calculus that you had last year about how much distance you need, a space you need in a classroom, how many kids can be in those classrooms, how much ventilation you, can be, you need to, to make those classrooms safe, as well as the testing that you were just talking about? Look, if you are not steeped in this like you and I are, a lot of this is pretty confusing. The rules change all the time. There's a virus now that has hit a million people. And so part of the dilemma we have is the misinformation and you know this constant change of information. This is what we know right now. Number one, Omicron's highly transmissible. Number two, from South Africa, we know that it is less dangerous, particularly if you're vaccinated and boosted. That's what we know. We also know that kids are getting sick with a bunch of different things, including flu. And, you know, so all of this is starting to show up in hospitals, plus the numbers mean it's starting to show up higher. So the people who said that it didn't matter, I think we're very, to kids, we're very wrong. Of course it matters. But what happens is that if we have these mitigations, we can actually deal with um, being, you know, being in school, which is best for kids. And those mitigations are, please get vaccinated and boosted. It means if you get Omicron, like I did, you're gonna have, you're gonna be, you know, you're gonna have mild symptoms. Number two, the ventilation is really important because it, Omicron's really, really transmissible. Number three, high level masks like N95s or, or and, you know, are really important because Omicron's really transmissible. And number four, the testing lets you see what you can't see so that if you test mm -hmm. positive, you have to stay home and be in isolation. That's what we know. Right. Randy Weingarten, I am so happy that you've recovered from COVID and you're doing fine. I'm just as happy that you chose to join us here on the show tonight. I really appreciate your time. 